All right. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, I am Ken Exner, uh, the Director of Developer Tools in AWS. And this is Transforming Software Development. Uh, it's a bit of an ambitious title, I know. Um, uh, hopefully, I can make good on this. Uh, all right. So a couple years ago, uh, we were out talking to customers, uh, potential customers of AWS, uh, people who were looking to move to EC2 and S3, and we started noticing a pattern emerge. Uh, these customers would tell us, you know, we're, we're totally bought in on the cloud. Uh, you, know, you don't need to sell us on S3 and EC2. But what we want to hear about is, what do you guys do internally inside of Amazon? What tools and software, what tools and software development processes do you guys follow? Uh, these customers were in the process of moving to agile processes or moving to DevOps, moving to the cloud. Uh, and they had heard that Amazon was famously a DevOps-oriented culture, that we were uh, known for our agility. Uh, you, know, you see these feature releases that we do every year. We do hundreds of feature releases. And customers wanted to know, how do you do that? Like, what does Amazon do inside, uh, inside allows us to be so agile? So in this talk, uh, I'm going to answer some of those questions. I'm going to talk about uh, the, the transformation that Amazon made itself over the last 15 years to a DevOps-oriented uh, culture. Uh, we didn't always start off that way. So uh, we started off uh, you know, different processes, different, uh, you know, different model of software development and software delivery. Um, but over the last 15 years, we transformed to being very agile, a DevOps-oriented culture. And I'm going to tell you that story. I'm going to tell you about the things that changed inside of Amazon over those 15 years, uh, and also the tools that emerged to support that. Uh, so we had to develop a lot of new tools inside of Amazon to support these new uh, processes. And I'm going to talk about not only how we develop these tools, but how we're now making them available to you, our customers, uh, in the form of AWS Code Deploy, AWS Code Pipeline, and AWS Code Commit. Uh, these are three new products that we recently announced or pre-announced uh, that are based on or inspired by our internal tools, uh, things that we've been using for the last 12, 15 years and have been uh, improving on over that time. Uh, at the end, if there's a bit of time, I can do some Q&A off to the side. Uh, but let's go ahead and get going. Uh, and take a, a look back in time, go through the, uh, the journey that Amazon made to a DevOps-oriented uh, uh, culture. So if we go back 14, 15 years, let's say literally to 2001. Um, back in 2001, uh, Amazon was uh, this is Amazon.com. This is before AWS, the retail site. Amazon.com was a monolithic architecture. Uh, it was an interior architecture, but it was basically one big monolith. Uh, what that meant is that it was one code base that everyone was you know, clobbering away at, and we were deploying it as a single unit. So it was a monolithic architecture that was deployed as a single unit. And as typically happens when you have this kind of architecture, a monolithic architecture, uh, it didn't scale. Uh, it start, we started to slow down. We started having bottlenecks. Uh, every time we wanted to release software, we had to you know, do all kinds of regression. It became um, a bit uh, overwhelming. We couldn't, we couldn't continue doing this architecture because it was slowing us down. Uh, so something had to change. We realized we had to change our, our architecture. We had to change how we organized around that architecture. And we also had to change some of the cultural aspects about how we, how we dealt with our software development. So two fundamental changes happened. One was an architectural change, and one was an organizational and cultural change. Uh, the first, the architectural change, is we literally exploded the monolith and turned it uh, into a service-oriented architecture. So um, we moved towards a service-oriented architecture where everything was turned into a service, and every service had an interface, and these services communicated with each other over these interfaces. Uh, and if you look at this picture, this is actually a, a, a depiction that someone did inside of Amazon of what Amazon looked like after this uh, explosion into these services. Uh, this depicts each of the little uh, rectangles here, the blue and pink rectangles, uh, depicts one of these services uh, communicating with all the other services over these interfaces. Uh, so we moved to the service-oriented architecture from this monolithic architecture. And one of the tenets that we had was that every service had to be small, had to be small, focused, and simple. Uh, we called this architecture primitives. We, wanted to, we were moving away from this monolithic large structure, so we went kind of the opposite direction. Everything became a primitive meaning that it had to be small, simple, and focused. Um, so we had, we had primitives for everything. We had a, a primitive for tax calculation on the website. We had a primitive for how to display the buy button uh, on a detail page. Everything became a primitive. Uh, today, I guess we would call this a microservices style architecture, uh, but we called it primitives. It was a service-oriented architecture where we had these primitives that were doing very focused, uh, simple things. 
So that was the, the architectural change that we made. Uh, the other change that we made was an organizational uh, or cultural change. Uh, we were moving towards agile processes. And as part of that, we decentralized the organization. Um, we turned uh, you know, what used to be one sort of big development team into a bunch of small teams. Uh, we called these literally uh, two pizza teams. And uh, this was simply a clever way of describing uh, the fact that we wanted these teams to be small. Um, the rule of thumb was that the team had to be no bigger than could be fed by two pizzas, uh, which I was told meant uh, eight or ten people, but I, I don't know how eight or ten people can eat two, uh, two pizzas. Uh, but these were you know, lean teams that had to be small. Uh, and beyond just being small, they had to have end-to-end -end ownership. So they had to own development and operations, testing, product management, uh, all aspects of uh, developing and owning one of these services. Uh, so we created these small, autonomous, uh, accountable teams that own development and operations and everything else. Uh, and we didn't realize we were, we were sort of moving towards this DevOps philosophy, but that's essentially what was happening. Uh, by creating teams, small autonomous teams that had ownership of development and operations, not separate teams for development, not separate teams for operations, but uh, you know, single teams that uh, owned development and operations, we were moving towards DevOps. And we were also preserving our startup heritage. Uh, Amazon essentially became a company of hundreds and thousands of little startups under, underneath one umbrella. So we could move with the agility of a hundred or thousands of little startups. All right, so once we made the architectural change to moving towards a service-oriented architecture and we made the, the cultural or organizational change of decentralizing and moving towards uh, these small two pizza teams, uh, we then realized we needed new, new tools. Uh, a lot of the ways that we had previously deployed and released software didn't work anymore. Uh, we actually used to literally have a, a centralized deployment team that handled all deployments inside of Amazon. Uh, well, that didn't work in a world where you had thousands of teams uh, and thousands of, of services that needed to be, de to be deployed. So we, we created a new tools team that was uh, chartered with creating uh, tools that could be self-service uh, self tools. Uh, they had to support this agile process. Um, but a couple other requirements that were pretty unique. One is that they had to be technology agnostic because Amazon wasn't just a Java shop or a Ruby shop or uh, a Perl shop, as I guess we were known for. Um, we had every technology under the sun uh, in use at Amazon. So the tools we had had to be technology agnostic and language agnostic. Um, and the other important thing is that we realized we didn't want teams making the same mistakes over and over again. So we needed the tools to uh, codify best practices and provide guardrails. Uh, so that teams were making the same mistakes, that we would learn something, we would put that into a best practice, create guardrails so that teams wouldn't make that mistake over again. Uh, so we, we wanted the tools to help us become better and uh, you know, more efficient in, in how, we, how we release software. Uh, I'll describe a couple of the services that emerged. The first was Apollo. Uh, this is a name borrowed from NASA. It's, uh, it's used to describe the internal deployment system that we use at Amazon. And Apollo is used to deploy everything from the retail site to the web services. It's used pervasively, uh, pervasively across uh, Amazon. Uh, and it's been used uh, for over a dozen years. So when we first introduced this a dozen years ago, it was after we broke into in these small teams owning these microservices. Uh, we created this deployment service that would be self-service. Um, and it got smarter and smarter over the, over the last decade. Uh, we learned how to do deployments without uh, downtime, without having to impact customers. And you don't go to Amazon and, and see that we're doing a deployment, you know, don't come back later or it's spitting 500s because we're doing a deployment. Um, and that's because we started getting smarter about how to incrementally release software so that customers wouldn't see that it, uh, we were doing a deployment. Um, but also, you know, not just impacting customers during a deployment, but making sure that if we're pushing out something that uh, has, a, has a problem, that we can, we can isolate that and, and roll back and not propagate that across the rest of the fleet. So a lot of sophisticated things started getting uh, pushed into Apollo um, in terms of how we, how we deployed software. It got smarter and smarter, uh, and the workflow engine started um, being able to do everything from uh, you know, versioning art artifacts to rolling back to automated health checking. Uh, another tool that emerged uh, after Apollo was pipelines. Uh, and pipelines is our continuous delivery or release automation uh, uh, service inside of Amazon. Uh, and this started back in 2008. Uh, and a couple guys in the Builder Tools team, they did a study of how long it was taking us, on average, across Amazon to go from code check-in to having that code running in production. 
Uh, so how long from code check-in to build to test, to, you know, pushing out across different environments to finally having that code in production? Uh, and they found it was uh, embarrassingly long. It was weeks and weeks of time on average. Uh, and they, we reported this to the executives at Amazon and uh, you know, they of course said we need to fix this. Um, if there's anything you, want, you should know about Amazon is that we pride ourselves on efficiency. Uh, everything has to be efficient. Uh, you know, we're, the, we're the people with uh, robots in our fulfillment centers. We're trying to always make things more and more uh, efficient. Uh, and we saw this uh, as essentially a broken production line. Uh, we had a production line that was inefficient, had all kinds of human processes uh, in, in, that was making it slow. Uh, it wasn't that the build was taking weeks, it wasn't that a deployment was taking weeks or testing, any of these individual parts of the release process. It was the, the human interaction, the, the, the way, to, you know, me sending a notification to another developer, that developer bunching up a bunch of changes, uh, all the human uh, manual steps in between that was taking long. So we set out to automate that and we turned it into a completely automa uh, uh, automated system from code check-in to, uh, to having that in production and allowed developers and teams inside of Amazon to uh, basically model their entire release process and run it in an automated way. Uh, today, um, well north of 90% of the teams at Amazon uh, use pipelines. Uh, it's how we do our releases. Uh, everything is modeled in this. Uh, everything from S3 to the website, the retail website, is modeled in pipelines. Uh, so it's very flexible and it allows us to basically automate all the manual steps that would have slowed this down. All right, so what happens when you have thousands of teams at Amazon all uh, deploying this microservices or uh, primitive style architecture, uh, having multiple environments, uh, multiple testing environments, perhaps multiple environments across uh, different regions, uh, practicing continuous delivery? You get a ridiculous number of deployments. Uh, last year, uh, we did 50 million deployments inside of Amazon using Apollo. This is just inside of Amazon, so not customers using it, just internal teams using Apollo. 50 million deployments. Uh, that's a deployment and a half every second. Uh, and that's you know, from these thousands of teams pushing this constantly. So, back to our customers. When our customers asked us, you know, is there anything we do inside of Amazon? Are there any tools that we have that might be useful to them? We looked internally and said, of course. Yeah, we've been doing this for a while now. So, in the rest of this talk, I'm gonna describe how you can use code deploy, code pipeline, and code commit, which are based on our internal tools to build your own DevOps pipeline. Uh, so that you can uh, automate your release pipeline just that, you know, the same way Amazon does. Going from source code check-in to having that code in production and automating everything in between. This will allow you to produce uh, uh, software more quickly, uh, be more efficient, and have uh, fewer errors in that release process. Uh, and be able to iterate more quickly for your customers. All right, so let's get going with uh, AWS Code Deploy, uh, the deployment service. So why do you need a deployment service? Uh, a number of reasons, but one is if you're gonna uh, create a DevOps pipeline, you're gonna wanna automate your deployments because um, you're gonna be doing a lot of them. Uh, you're gonna have you know, more releases, you're gonna have smaller bat you're gonna batch, up your you're not gonna batch up your releases, you're gonna do small incremental pushes, uh, you're gonna be deploying across multiple environments, um, so you're gonna want that to be as automated as possible. You don't wanna have any friction in that, in that pipeline. So you're gonna wanna automate the deployments. Uh, another reason is that you wanna manage complexity. Uh, and what I mean by this is that it, uh, if you're a single developer deploying to one box, it's simple. You just SSH into that box, you run your scripts and your deployment's done. Um, but what happens when you add more boxes or, or more developers you know, trying to deploy that, those same boxes? Uh, you don't want to SSH into a, you know, hundreds of, of different boxes to. Uh, run your deployment script. So you're gonna want to make sure that you have an, a deployment system that can deploy that for you in an automated way. Uh, and you're gonna want to avoid downtime. So you're not, you're not gonna want your customers to know you're doing deployment. Uh, you're, not, you're not gonna want them to see uh, 500s or see you know, you know, glitches on your site as you're doing the deployment. Uh, also, you're, you're gonna wanna make sure that if you do a deployment that pushes out something bad or you have a, 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 an error in your deployment scripts, uh, that your deployment service can capture that and, and isolate it and not propagate that error across the rest of your fleet. So we introduced AWS Code Deploy. Uh, we launched this back uh, in November at reInvent. Uh, it is uh, generally available. Uh, you can begin using it today. Uh, it is uh, based on Apollo, so it allows you to deploy like Amazon does. 
Uh, it shares the same back end as Apollo, same workflow logic as Apollo. So all the things that we have learned and put into Apollo, uh, you get to benefit from. Uh, to use code deploy, you teach it how to deploy to one instance, uh, and it will replicate that across any number of instances. So you can deploy to hundreds or thousands uh, of instances the same way as you would one. Um, and also like Apollo, it allows you to deploy without downtime. And I'll show you how this happens through rolling deployments. Uh, you, you basically uh, push out your deployment incrementally without impacting the entire fleet. Um, code deploy also allows you to centralize your deployment so that, or uh, you know, be able to view uh, what version of software is running on any fleet at any time. It provides a, an archive of all your uh, deployable artifacts so you can go back and see what was running on any uh, environment at any time. And it gives you sort of that control and monitoring about what software is running where. Uh, and best of all, uh, there's no additional charge for using code deploy. Uh, you just pay for the EC2 instances that you're running, there's no additional charge. Uh, I will um, caveat that and say we, we uh, announced a new feature last week, uh, which is support for on-premise instances. Uh, we do charge for that, that is two cents per instance update. Um, but the, you know, the cool thing about this is that you can use code deploy now to uh, do deployments to on-premise servers. So if you have your own, da your own servers in your data, uh, data center, you can use the same deployment service to deploy to EC2 as you do to your own data centers. Uh, all it needs is um, to establish a connection back to, uh, to code deploy, a long polling connection, so the instance calls us to wait for instructions. Um, and basically that means any device with an internet connection that can call us can receive a deployment. Uh, so you can deploy to your laptop, you can deploy anywhere using the same deployment service. Pretty cool. Uh, let me show you how to use code deploy. Uh, there's three simple steps. Uh, the first step is you're gonna wanna package up your application. Uh, and when you package up your application, you're gonna want to create what we call an app spec file. Uh, an app spec file is a bit of con uh, configuration. Uh, you can see a, a sample here. Uh, it's YAML code, so it's a bit of YAML. Uh, and there's a couple sections here I'll call out. The first is the file section. Uh, this teaches uh, code deploy where to copy files. So where to pull from and where to, where to copy your files. Uh, the second thing I'll call out here is the hooks. There are uh, seven different lifecycle events in code deploy. So during each deployment, it's gonna iterate through seven different lifecycle events. And during these lifecycle events, you can attach scripts. Uh, you can, you know, there's hooks for attaching scripts. And these scripts can be anything. They can be PowerShell scripts, they can be bash scripts, uh, they can be chef recipes, as uh, this sample shows here. Uh, and this goes back to the idea that uh, we have to have tools that are technology agnostic, whether it's languages, whether it's configuration management tools. Uh, this will work with Puppet, this will work with PowerShell, this will work with uh, SaltStack, Ansible, you name it. Uh, there's actually a bunch of templates available that show you how to use this. If you go to uh, our Git, uh, the AWS Labs repository in GitHub, you can see a bunch of templates for how to integrate this with a number of different tools. Uh, but the cool thing here is you can bring your own scripts, uh, it can be anything, attach it to one of these hooks, uh, and uh, you're, you're set. Uh, step two is you're gonna want to set up your targets, set up the target environments. Uh, and these are the instances that are gonna receive a deployment. Uh, and we call this in code deploy uh, a deployment group. So a deployment group is a, a set of instances uh, whether they are EC2 instances or instances in your own data, own data center, uh, that you want to receive one deployment. Uh, and you can define the deployment group uh, either by tags, using EC2 tags or on-premise tags. Uh, so in this example here, uh, you have a staging deployment group and a production deployment group, and that might be based on a tag, where uh, environment equals production, or environment equals staging. So you, you, you can use tags to define the deployment group, you can also use auto-scaling groups to define a deployment group. So you can just point us at an auto-scaling group if you're using auto-scaling, and code deploy will know to uh, deploy to that auto-scaling group. Uh, the other cool thing about this is that uh, the integration with auto-scaling knows uh, that it's not gonna put an instance uh, production until it's received the software update. So the interaction with uh, auto-scaling allows it to uh, bring up an instance, uh, have code deploy, uh, uh, update the software on there so it matches the rest of the fleet, and then put it into service. Uh, so that way you have, you're not bringing up instances that are, uh, are the wrong version of software. Uh, so once you've created your app spec file, and step two, you've set up your target environments, you're then gonna deploy. Uh, and this is pretty, uh, pretty simple, it's just a simple command. 
Uh, you can do this you know, through a button click in the console or you can uh, use the command line tools or SDKs. Uh, it's also completely API driven, uh, which also means that you can do this through the interfaces. And a number of partners uh, have provided integrations with this that allow you to use code deploy um, from various CI CD tools uh, like Travis, uh, CodeShip, Circle CI. Uh, a number of different uh, vendors have provided integrations. Uh, I'll, sh I'll come back and tell you a bit about uh, all the integrations that are available. But if you're using one of these tools, they're automatically integrated with code deploy, and you can automatically trigger uh, a deployment from these tools. Uh, GitHub is another company that provided an integration. Uh, I'm actually going to do a demo of this to show you how you can do uh, a deployment straight from GitHub. Uh, it's pretty cool, and I'll show you that in a second. Uh, one of the important concepts to understand about code deploy is that you can choose your deployment speed. Uh, speed is not always the best thing because you want to uh, balance uh, the availability, availability of your site with how quickly a deployment goes. Uh, and you can choose anything from one at a time to all at once or anything in between. It's completely configurable. Uh, and what this is going to do is it's going to teach us how to do the rolling deployment. Uh, to show you how this works, uh, imagine that you have three instances sitting behind a load balancer. Uh, and these three instances are all running version one of your software. And you're going to want to push out a change to version two. Uh, and let's say that you have configured this to deploy to your fleet uh, a third of a, t a third at a time. Uh, a third of a time here would be one instance at a time. So what's going to happen is uh, code deploy is going to take one instance out from behind the load balancer, update it to version two, and then put it back in. And then move on to the next instance, update it to version two, and then put it back in. And then the same for the third instance, and then put it back in until all the instances are running version two. Um, now, let's say that there's a problem uh, during your deployment. Uh, let's say you're deploying to version three, uh, and there's some you know, failure in one of your scripts or something happens. Uh, code deploy is going to stop uh, or abort the deployment um, because it's, it recognizes that there's an issue, one of the scripts failed, or one of the things it was expecting didn't work out right, uh, or one of the validations didn't work. Uh, it then allows you to roll back to version two uh, be, you know, without propagating that same, um, uh, that same error across uh, to the other instances. Uh, and then you're back in version two. Uh, so this is a you know, pretty important feature that it uh, isolates the, the error, doesn't propagate that across the rest of, your, rest of your fleet, and allows you to roll back. All right, so enough talking. Let's, uh, let's show you code deploy. Uh, I'm going to do a demo. And this is a, a demo someone on my team wrote. Uh, it's a Magic 8-Ball app. Uh, I assume everyone knows the Magic 8-Ball app, or Magic 8-Ball that you shake, and it uh, gives you some uh, witty response. Uh, let's see, Magic 8-Ball, is this demo going to work? Uh, Outlook, not so good. All right. <laughs> um, so this is a, a simple um, uh, Python app. And what it's doing is it's uh, spitting out some responses here. It's spitting out some uh, Magic 8-Ball uh, quips down here. And below this, you can see I have three instances uh, sitting behind a load balancer, and they're all in service. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to uh, GitHub, uh, where I store the source for this, uh, for this application. And I'm going to kick off a deployment um, after a commit. So GitHub has provided a, a post commit hook that allows me to automatically deploy uh, following a commit. And I'll show you how that works. Uh, so this is the, uh, the, the GitHub repository here. Uh, it, you can see this is the Magic 8-Ball Flask app. It's a, a Flask application in Python. Uh, one of the things I'll point out here is that you can see here there's an app spec file. And this is the YAML file I spoke about earlier. Um, this is the configuration that you include with your application directory. Uh, you see a lot of the things that uh, I talked about before, the, the, the files that you're copying, the hooks. Uh, there's a number of these samples that you can find on our uh, GitLab, uh, AWS Labs repository in GitHub. Um, but going back here, I'm going to go find uh, this file here. This is the file that returns, this is the backend service to this Flask app that returns a bunch of responses. And I'm going to go ahead and make a, a change here. I'm going to use the uh, little editor here uh, in GitHub. And I'm going to say, hello, summit. And I'm going to go ahead and commit that. Um, so GitHub has a post, I've already set up the uh, post commit uh, hook that uh, uh, triggers a deployment. 
And if I go over to the console, this is the AWS console, the uh, code deploy console, and I refresh this, you'll see that a deployment has been kicked off 17 seconds ago, so right after I did that commit, it kicked off a deployment. Uh, if I open this up, you can see that uh, one uh, instance, I'm, I'm rolling this out one instance at a time. So the, I'm doing the same thing I, I showed you uh, where it's doing one instance at a time. So it's gonna do one instance, put it back into service, take the second instance out, update that, put it back into service, and then the same for the third. Uh, and this is gonna keep going, and while this happens, if I go back to my app here, you'll see that uh, this one has been taken uh, out and it's back in service. Uh, in a second, this one will go out of service uh, and then it will be updated and then be put back in. Uh, and the entire time this happens, the, the app continues to serve traffic because it's still serving traffic from two instances while the third is being uh, updated. So here you can see the second one is, is out of service and the other two are serving up all the traffic. Um, while that finishes, uh, I'll show you a couple other uh, features that uh, are important about using code deploy. If I click on this, I can view the instances that are part of this deployment. You can see there's three instances here. Uh, this has been, up, it's uh, updated to, the third is in progress. For any of these uh, instances that have been part of this deployment, I can view events. Uh, and these are the, the seven lifecycle events I talked about before. These are the events it's gonna go through. It's gonna stop the application, it's gonna download the bundle, it's gonna do the install, and then it's gonna do any kind of validation that you want. You can see here, it's succeeded all, the, all these uh, steps. You can see the duration. If there are any problems, uh, if there are any errors with any of these steps, uh, you'd see an error here, and you'd see uh, a tail of the logs here. So you can e very easily debug the issue, uh, because we provide, you know, provide the tail of the, the log here uh, for easy debugging. Uh, and then some actions you can, that you can use for remediation. Uh, going back to this, uh, this is probably just about done. Uh, so it's gonna be updating the, the third instance and, and that'll bring back into production and then uh, we'll be done. Done, there it is. So three instances have been updated. The, the app has been uh, changed uh, based on a commit from GitHub. So what I've demoed here is one of the integrations that uh, we have available. This is the one that GitHub did uh, that allows you to do a uh, deployment straight from GitHub. Uh, but if you have any um, you know, build or test uh, steps that you wanna do, uh, say you're doing a Java app and you need to build or something like that. Uh, we also have a number of partners that have uh, built in integrations with uh, build and CI systems. So you can use uh, Travis, for example. If you're using GitHub, you can then do your builds on Travis and then Travis will kick off the deployment straight to code deploy. Uh, same thing with Circle CI, CodeShip, Solano Labs, uh, all these partners. Um, uh, this also works very well with configuration management tools. So we've partnered with uh, companies like Puppet Labs, uh, SaltStack, uh, Ansible, and Chef uh, to provide uh, templates that demonstrate how you can use those configuration management tools together with Code Deploy. And I encourage you to check that out. Uh, this allows you to you know, continue using those scripts if you do, uh, use any of those configuration management languages together with Code Deploy. Uh, all right, uh, let's talk now about AWS Code Pipeline. And AWS Code Pipeline uh, is the release automation service uh, inspired by pipelines uh, used internally. Uh, let's first ask the question, why do we need to use release automation? Um, well, one is once you, once you automate your deployments, you're gonna wanna deploy uh, automate the entire workflow. You're gonna learn like Amazon did that uh, you're, gonna be ha you're gonna have a lot of manual steps you know, human steps in that process that you're gonna wanna automate. Uh, so you're not taking weeks like Amazon uh, had been taking uh, to do a typical release. You're gonna wanna automate that so that it's as uh, efficient as possible. Uh, this is gonna allow you to release more quickly and it's gonna also create a higher quality release uh, for a couple of reasons. One is um, anytime you have human uh, steps, you're gonna have you know, problems with human errors. Uh, you also don't want um, uh, all the, all, all the uh, rules about how to do deployment in someone's head. Uh, if, if it's in someone's head, it can be put into a script. It can be put into a test. It can be put into automation. Uh, that way you're not dependent on that person remembering how to do a release. Or, or if someone else comes into your team, uh, they can do a release and you're not dependent on the knowledge that's in one person's head. So you'll, you'll have better quality releases, more consistent releases 
uh, if you have automation. So we've been working on code pipeline. Uh, we pre-announced this at reInvent, uh, and this is based on pipelines, the, the internal product uh, of, that uh, shares its name. Uh, and this is in private beta today. You can sign up uh, on the website if you're interested in trying it out. Uh, we're letting customers in in, in waves. Uh, this will be released publicly soon, uh, but if you're interested in trying it out early, uh, I encourage you to go to the website, uh, to the pipelines page on AWS, and you can sign up for the private beta. Uh, and this will allow you to release software uh, like Amazon does. Um, and it will allow you to automate the entire release process from source to production. Uh, and in this example here, uh, I, I show uh, how you can model pull in source, doing a build, uh, followed by unit tests, uh, then deploying to a beta stage, followed by some UI tests, uh, followed by a deployment to a gamma stage, another pre-production stage, uh, followed by a load test, and then deploying to three regions in production. Uh, maybe your, your, your uh, release process isn't this complicated, or more, maybe it's more complicated. Uh, it doesn't matter. Code, uh, code Pipeline will let you uh, model that entire release process. Uh, it's used to model everything inside of Amazon, um, so we, we're fairly confident it can model the release process that you have. Um, so it's not, not only built for, with flexibility in mind, it's also built with extensibility in mind. Uh, and this was important in the customers that we talked to. They wanted us to be able to allow them to continue using the tools that they use today and not be forced to change. So if you use GitHub, you can continue using GitHub. Uh, if you use Jenkins for build, you can continue using Jenkins for build. Uh, customers wanted to be able to mix and match the tools that they, they had. And what they wanted from us is to help them integrate that end-to-end -end release process uh, so that they didn't have to. So integrate that end-to-end -end process in the cloud and allow customers to use whatever tools that they want. Uh, this is a pretty powerful concept. Um, so we built a plugin architecture. All this is built on a, a plugin architecture, and the integrations that we have done, uh, we've done on top of that plugin architecture. So we, we've integrated uh, Code Deploy, for example, as a deployment engine on top of this, uh, on top of this plugin architecture. Uh, Third-party um, uh, partners have also um, been uh, in integrating uh, with Code Pipeline so that at launch, you'll be able to use a number of third-party products as part of this release process. Uh, and the other thing is that customers can also use this plugin architecture to integrate whatever tools that they have. Uh, so if you have your own testing tools and you want to integrate that into this, uh, you can use that. Uh, maybe it's your own Selenium box or whatever you have that's proprietary. Uh, you can integrate that into Code Pipeline and have it uh, integrated with uh, uh, your cloud-based release automation. Uh, I'll show you how this works, actually, in a second. Um, I'm going to go over to a demo. All right. Let it settle. OK. So this is a, uh, a pipeline that I've already created. Um, and uh, this is a running pipeline right now. Um, you can see it's. Uh, uh, in process of doing build. Um, and the thing to understand about Code Pipeline is that uh, the two fundamental concepts, one is stages and actions. Uh, and a stage um, can be, is depicted by these boxes here. So this is, uh, this is a source stage, uh, this is a build stage, and this is a beta stage. Uh, if I go down, I can see a production stage. Uh, and these, sta these stages can be whatever you want. And inside of these stages, you have actions. So the first box here, I have a source stage, uh, and I've created an action to pull uh, from GitHub. Uh, once that's complete, it's going to go on to the build stage, where it's going to do a build in Jenkins. Uh, once that build is complete, it's going to go ahead and go to the beta stage. And all this is going to happen automatically. If I wanted to, I can, I can uh, put a block here so that it doesn't advance until I, I, I let it advance. Uh, but it auto, it's an automatically uh, proceed from, from stage to stage when, when any of the actions in that stage uh, return successful. So it's going to complete the Jenkins build, and then it's going to go to the beta stage, uh, where I have three actions. Uh, and what this demonstrates is that actions can be parallel or sequential. Uh, so you can see I have a, a, a deployment using AWS code deploy to a beta fleet followed sequentially um, by two parallel actions. Uh, it's going to do a load test in SOSTA, and then it's going to do some UI tests in SOS Labs. Uh, once those actions complete, it's going to advance to the production stage, or uh, production uh, stage here. Um, what I, but what I've done here is I've inserted uh, what we call a gate. 
Uh, and this gate here is a, is a manual approval gate, so I can say that you know, uh, the director or the manager of this team uh, can do, uh, has to uh, manually approve anything before it goes to production. There's a number of different gates that we'll have available. Uh, this shows a manual gate, but gates can be time-based. Uh, they can be based on calendar. They can be based on uh, monitoring and metrics. Uh, but you have this, this abstract concept of a gate that you can apply anywhere in this pipeline to control the flow. Uh, so that, that shows you the basic concepts in code pipeline. Uh, there are these stages that contain actions. Uh, things advance automatically from stage to stage unless you block it with a gate uh, or manually. All right, uh, the last service I'm gonna talk about is AWS Code Commit. Uh, so we've, we've automated our deployments, we've automated the release uh, pipeline, now let's talk about the source control system that sits at the very front of that. Uh, and this is an area where customers started telling us uh, if they're gonna be moving all their tools and all their environments to the cloud, if they're gonna be moving their build, to, build environments and test environments uh, and production environments to the cloud, why not also move their source control? Uh, and for a couple of reasons, one, performance benefits uh, of having your source code next to your build environments, next to your, your test environments. Uh, you're gonna have lower latency. Um, but also customers wanted something that would be fully managed. Uh, they didn't want to continue to have to manage their own source control systems. Uh, so they asked us, can you give us something that we can just simply turn on uh, that is fully managed, uh, source code, uh, source control in the cloud. Um, they also wanted these to be highly available. Uh, especially as you start using uh, uh, DevOps pipelines that start pulling on your source control system a lot, you're gonna wanna make sure that these source control systems are always available. Uh, and the most important requirement we got from customers was that it had to be uh, not as secure, but more secure than anything they, they could do inside their own, uh, inside, uh, their own walls. Uh, they wanted this to be more secure than something they could build themselves and manage themselves. Uh, and the last requirement was that uh, they wanted um, it to be able to store anything, not be limited uh, by the, in the size of objects that it could store or the size of repositories. Uh, they wanted the, the promise of the cloud brought to source control systems for them to be scalable, infinitely scalable. Uh, so we have been working on AWS code commit. Uh, this was also pre-announced uh, at reInvent. Uh, it is in private beta. You can sign up on the website. Uh, we're letting customers in. Uh, it will be released publicly soon. Uh, and this is, you can think of it as Git on top of S3. Uh, so it allows you to uh, store private Git repositories in the cloud. Uh, Git on top of S3. That means you get the best of both worlds. You get the familiar Git interface. Uh, if you're using Git today, all the Git operations will work uh, without any modification. Uh, every Git client will work. It's a full fidelity, full fidelity implementation of the Git protocol. Uh, and you also get the benefits of the cloud. Uh, which means that it's, you get the durability uh, guarantees of, of, of S3 and DynamoDB, so your data is replicated across uh, different AZs. Uh, you get the availability of these services. Um, you also get the scalability. So you, there's no, no size limit on the files, on the objects uh, that you can store in this. There's no, uh, there's no limit on how big a repository can be. Uh, and you can have infinite number of repositories. So scaling in three different dimensions. Um, and perhaps you know, the most important thing is it's secure. Uh, it uses IAM, so you can use fine grained permissions in IAM to lock down uh, your repository. Uh, all, the, all the benefits of IAM are available uh, to code commit. Uh, all the other features of IAM like uh, SAML integration and uh, directory inter uh, integration, AD integration are available with this. Uh, and the last thing is it's integrated with the key management service. And for those of you who don't know, the key management service was launched last year and it allows you to uh, encrypt data in AWS services with your own keys. So uh, the key management service will provide your own keys and will allow you to encrypt data in S3 or RDS or EBS. Uh, it is also integrated with code commit so that your data is encrypted at rest. So that means data in uh, code commit is encrypted in, at rest and in transit. Uh, pretty cool. Um, and as I said, it's the same Git uh, experience. Uh, all the Git commands that you uh, love or hate, uh, Git commit, Git push, they all work the same way. Uh, the only thing that's different is that you're pointing at a different endpoint. You can see in the first line here, I'm pointing it at an AWS endpoint. But everything else is exactly the same. Uh, the same Git experience. All right, so to wrap up, uh, AWS code commit, 
is our private Git solution on the cloud. Uh, you can think of it as Git on top of S3. Uh, it is in private beta. You can sign up today. Uh, we will be releasing this uh, to the general public soon. I encourage you to uh, sign up if you're interested uh, in, in trying it early. Uh, AWS Code Pipeline is our release automation service uh, based on pipelines, the same tool we use inside of Amazon to automate our releases uh, end to end. Uh, same thing, you can, you can sign up for the private beta if you're interested. Uh, this will be launching soon. Uh, and AWS Code Deploy is available today. It, it launched uh, last November. Uh, this is our deployment service that allows you to automate your deployments. It is based on Apollo, the internal deployment system uh, that we use inside of Amazon and have been using for a dozen years. Uh, I encourage you to use that today. You can use it to deploy to EC2 as well as to your own uh, instances in your own data center or any device with an internet connection. Uh, thank you for listening. I, uh, I'll stick around uh, if anyone has questions, uh, but thank you.